If of me you often think, send me back my bow of pink. If to me you would be true, send me back my bow of blue. If you are another girl's fellow, send me back my bow of yellow. If to me you would be wed, send me back my bow of red. If with me you wouldn't be seen, send me back my bow of green. Welcome to Femme Macabre, a podcast about oddities, curiosities, mysteries, and of course, the macabre, hosted by Stephanie Malosh and Erin Vance. When you think of Valentine's Day, what comes to mind? For me, it's heart-shaped boxes of chocolate with a few pieces missing, red satin pajamas from Walmart watching rom-coms with my mom, middle school dances with pink balloon arches and awkward two-stepping, or that one time that everyone in my fourth grade class got a valentine from the cutest boy in the grade, except for me. Obviously, I'm not a huge fan of this overly commercialized Hallmark holiday, but like any good folklore enthusiast, I wanted to investigate some of the traditions associated with Valentine's Day. How did people celebrate this holiday before you could walk into literally any shop at any point in February, and pick up a red box of bonbons and a frilly pink card for your sweetheart. My research first led me to the National Folklore Collection at University College Dublin, specifically the Schools Collection. The Schools Collection was amassed in the 1930s in Ireland by school children, who asked their families, neighbours, and others in their districts a series of questions about the traditions, beliefs, and customs of their areas. The rhyme you heard at the beginning of this episode is from that collection. At the time this rhyme was collected, giving valentines had fallen out of fashion, but prior to the 1930s, it was common for girls especially to give valentines with colored ribbons tied to them, with each ribbon corresponding to the colors mentioned in the rhyme. Pink, blue, or red for love. Green, yellow, for rejection. So that's not super macabre, but... Thinking about the anxiety of giving Valentine's cards in elementary school definitely still gives me the heebie-jeebies. Interestingly, throughout my research in the National Folklore Collection, the tradition of giving out Valentine's seems to have died out around 1890, at least in Ireland. This surprised me, as choosing Valentine's cards and writing one to each member of my class at school was such a huge part of my childhood. This tradition of giving valentines to people seems to have been resurrected in some parts of the country around the 1950s, and letters were sent anonymously, lending the day a shroud of romantic mystery. And what do we love most at Femme Macabre? Mystery, of course. An account from County Wexford in Ireland gives a nod to a more sinister Valentine's Day tradition, wherein people would single out and make fun of those considered too old to marry by pinning what I can only imagine to have been rude drawings on their doors. Cue the anxiety for us as we rapidly approach our dirty 30s and turn into old spinsters. While I didn't find the most salacious Valentine's Day stories in the National Folklore Collection, I do have a delightfully macabre story for you straight from the heart of Dublin. For context, and this will be important later, there are about a dozen different St. Valentines in Catholic tradition. The remains of one of these St. Valentines was gifted to an Irish Carmelite preacher named John Spratt by Pope Gregory XVI in the early to mid-19th century. The remains were then taken to Whitefriar Street Church in Dublin. For most of their Dublin life, they were forgotten. I imagine it wasn't difficult to forget about the small, wax-sealed box tied with a silk ribbon. It seems like the sort of thing hanging out in any church basement. It was rediscovered in the 1950s or 60s when a shrine was built for the remains and they were made available to be visited by the public, usually couples wishing for their union to be blessed. The remains of a saint are usually referred to as relics, which, by definition, are the physical remnants of the deceased saint or items that may have held significance to them or come in contact with them while they were alive. This particular St. Valentine relic contains what is only known as some of the saint's body and a small vessel of his blood. This, to me, is extremely vague and creepy. Exactly the kind of stuff that we here at Femme Macabre love. Each Valentine's Day at Whitefriar Street Church, you can go and attend a ceremony where you can get your wedding rings blessed, you can have your relationship blessed, and you can 
attend a service that focuses on St. Valentine and has the general theme of love. So I mentioned how there were a dozen different St. Valentines, right? This is where it becomes important. Now, Dublin isn't the only city to host bits of the dismembered saint. Not by a long shot. Madrid and Rome are both home to the intact skulls of St. Valentine, and Helmno, Poland, is home to another piece of his skull. The relic in Poland, which is about the size of two fingers, can be viewed through glass and even kissed. One of St. Valentine's shoulder blades is housed in the basement of the Basilica of Saints Paul and Peter in Prague. Bones of the saint are also said to reside in Rockmar, France, some in Glasgow, and even some in a small town in Missouri. Wherever you are in the world, you're probably only a hop, skip, and a jump away from some random body part of St. Valentine to bless your union. Steph is now going to talk about Lupercalia, one of the potential precursors to Valentine's Day and a wonderfully interesting pagan festival. She's also going to touch on who the real St. Valentine might have been and some of the legends associated with him as a person. The imagery of wolves in Lupercalia is definitely something that is that has been passed down through a lot of the Roman writings about Lupercalia and the pagan holiday, but it has more so to do with the legends of the she-wolf who nursed Romulus and Remus, and how the descendants of Romulus and Remus started making up these factions of priesthoods, I guess is what I might call them. I wasn't quite sure because some research touched on it and then others didn't talk about the ancestry of the priesthoods at all. But basically, the the tradition starts with the Luperci, who are priests, and they would gather in the Luperical Cave, which is where Romulus and Remus were originally found with the she-wolf. Priests would gather in this cave associated with the legends of Romulus and Remus, and from there, that's where they would start the celebration. So they had two goats, which apparently represent sexuality, and they would sacrifice those in the name of their god Faunus. And they also sacrificed one other thing, a puppy. And some of the research that I read made it very clear that it had to be a puppy, not just any old dog, which is so sad to think about because I love puppies. After they've killed these goats and this puppy... The Luperci priests would then call on two of their younger priests, uh, who would be naked in the cave, and they would then wipe the blood from the blade, the ceremonial blade that they used to sacrifice the goats and the puppy, and wipe the blood on these two young priests' foreheads. And during this time, throughout this ceremony after the sacrifice these two young priests had to laugh and I'm not sure the reason I'm not sure what the reason is for laughing but it was just called like a ceremonial laugh and so while they had blood wiped across their forehead until the ceremony was over with um, milk soaked wool washing away the blood they would just have to laugh the whole time which to me sounds really freaky it's very unsettling to think about it. Just, like, imagine two naked dudes laughing. And I assume they're laughing creepily because they're in a cave in the dark. And they just have, like... And then they just have blood smeared across their foreheads like Simba. And then they're given a milk bath with some itchy wool. So they would soak some wool in milk. And then they would wipe away the blood. And so I kind of tried to do a bit of research on why they would have used milk... And I think it has to do with the fact that it's a fertility celebration. So milk, fertility, you know, life, the gift that a mother gives their child, right? So I assume that that's just the link that they're doing there. All right. So after they did that, like, whole blood and milk weirdness, they had a feast, of course, such as every good celebration should have. But then when the feast was over, they would, uh, the Luperci would cut strips from the goat hide to make little whips. And those whips were called thongs. Um, yeah, so then these two young naked Luperci priests would be running through the streets of Rome. They would be descending the hill of Palatine. And they would just start running around the streets of Rome, whipping anybody in their way. 
But it's not like a scary whipping. It was more of like a, ooh, like a fun little, we're whipping you for fertility. You know, a lot of people were really into it, the women especially, because they were being promised fertility. A lot of them would purposely get in the way of the Lupercai priests to get whipped by these thongs. Um, so the pagan Romans definitely had, you know, a couple of centuries to have their fun at it. Uh, but then, you know, over time, thanks to Christianity, being wild and naked became less popular. And then over time, women would just be running around and just getting slapped on their hand with a little whip by fully clothed men. No more are the naked Lupercai priests. The Pope really dampened a lot of spirits, I think. By the 5th century of the Common Era, Pope Galatius, he kind of just fully abolished Lupercalia in general because he wanted people to instead celebrate the purification of the Virgin Mary. Eventually, he just decided that he wanted to celebrate the martyrdom of St. Valentine. But just in case you were wondering... It wasn't entirely the end of celebrating fertility just because that people were dressing up. A lot of people still kind of celebrated that time of year as a time for baby making, I guess, would be the right way to put it. So the reason Pope Galatius decided to say that the 14th of February was a time to celebrate St. Valentine was because in the 3rd century... The Roman Emperor Claudius II executed a man, maybe two men, both named Valentine because he was illegally and secretly performing Christian weddings. And the Roman Emperor was like, no way. We are a pagan society. I don't want, you know, Christianity taken over. So he imprisoned Valentine. But the legend surrounding Valentine is kind of romantic as well, which isn't something that, I I don't think that's something that most people ever really hear about. At least I never heard about it until I did this research. But Valentine, while he was imprisoned, fell in love with the blind daughter of his jailer because he was tutoring her. And apparently after one night of intense prayer, he helped her gain her eyesight back. And I think that's pretty wild. During his imprisonment, he definitely tried to convert the Roman emperor into becoming a Christian. And so I think that just ended up moving up his his execution date up a little bit faster. The legend says that on the eve of his execution, he wrote his lover a note And at the end of the note, he signed it, From Your Valentine. Okay, so we know that if you're in a relationship and you're in 2020, your priority is to get to a church that houses bits of one of the many St. Valentines and have your union blessed. But what if you're single? And what if you can't participate in Lupercalia in ancient Rome? Perhaps you'd like to try some marriage divination to find out a bit about your next partner. Marriage divination is the act of performing certain rituals to gain insight into who you will marry or whether you will marry at all. A variation you might be familiar with is the game MASH, Mansion Apartment Shack House. Though marriage divination was practiced primarily on days such as Candlemas, Midsummer, and Halloween, it was also practiced primarily by young girls, all year. And if you're single on Valentine's Day, who doesn't want a glimpse of their future lover? In the Orkney Islands, there was a tradition to eat a salted herring before bed to invoke an apparition of your future husband during the night. An Irish tradition is for a young woman to pick a cabbage while blindfolded at night, and the appearance of the cabbage would mimic the attributes of the woman's future husband. If it was a rotten cabbage, the man would be rotten. If it was a robust cabbage, the man would be loyal. This is one of my favorite little bits of folklore. I find it so zany, so wonderful, and the picture of all these young girls in a cabbage patch at night, blindfolded, feeling around to want to like figure out what their future husband looks like, it's great. It's just fantastic. A tradition from Yorkshire, England, is to peel an apple all the way around in one strip and throw it over your left shoulder. Whatever shape it falls in will resemble the first initial of your future husband. (laughs) 
Since Steph is our resident single lady, I asked her to bring along something so that we could test out one of these marriage divinations on her. Do you have your apple, Steph? I've got my peeler and my apple. What am I doing? So you have to peel the apple all in one go. Okay, I'll give it a shot. Don't know if I'll be able to peel it all in one go, but let's see. Ugh, I hope you cut out the apple peeling sound. ASMR gives me all the wrong types of shivers, and I don't want to submit anybody else to that. Once you've peeled it, I want you to throw it over your left shoulder. <laughs> okay, maybe I should be getting out of bed for this. Okay. What the hell is that? What does it look like? Erin, I have no idea what letter this is. Okay, I'm going to send you a picture because I don't think, I don't know what this is. All right, we're also going to post a picture online so our listeners can help decipher this because, I mean, what is this? Okay, I just got your picture. I think it looks like a G. Maybe it's an S. (laughs) Really? I thought it looked more like an F maybe. Maybe it's a sign I'll have multiple husbands. (laughs) Maybe you'll have like six husbands, Jeffrey, Fred, Frank, George. (laughs) Maybe you're going to be a black widow. You're going to kill all your husbands. It does sound like a stellar get rich quick (laughs) scheme. (laughs) For the record, though, uh, to any lawyers listening, no matter what my internet search history says, I have not and will not ever murder my future husband, however many I end up having and however many end up dying mysteriously. In parts of Eastern England, it was believed that if a ladybird landed on you and you threw it up into the air, whichever direction it flew would be the direction in which your future lover lived. Marriage was hugely important for young women in years past, when higher education and even employment simply wasn't an option. So marriage divination, as trivial as it may appear to us, was a meaningful pastime and ritual. Even today, with less onus on marriage, we've nearly all played mash, plucked the petals off a daisy asking, does he love me? Does he love me not? And many of us have even had our astrology chart compared to a prospective partner. It's certainly not something that exists only in the past. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Fen Macabre. We hope that if you enjoyed it, you'll return next week and see what we have in store for our second episode. I'm Erin Vance. And I'm Stephanie Mosh. Have a spooky Valentine's Day. If you enjoyed listening to our first ever episode of Femicop, please consider leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Doing so gives us a chance to grace the ears of so many other lovers of the macabre, just like you. Also, if you're into social media, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Femicop. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you tune in next week. <laughs>